So the scripture reading for this morning is from, you go to the back of your Bible, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, starting at verse 1. And this is John describing his vision. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the vision we have in your word of our final destiny as followers of Jesus. Lord, thank you for the wonderful things that you have prepared for us. And Lord, as we think about heaven this morning, I pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to understand what you would have to say to us, and Lord, the difference that it can make in our lives today. And Lord, I pray that we will not just be hearers of the word, but doers of it. Help us to put it into action. Be with us as we worship you, as we praise your name, as we learn from your word, as we fellowship with one another. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor's going to play his horn a little bit, so nice to be able to blow your own horn once in a while. Something I'm... Place 
of full release, dear to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace, dear to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless, Redeemer, send from the heart of That was fun. We'll see how we do on the next one. 305 for anybody that's got a book. I think we're doing that in D, right? Tell it to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. Such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that two men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, he's a friend that's well known. You know other, such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow, tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He's a friend that's well known. You know other, such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ coming, kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's so well known. Brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Of what does the Bible say about heaven? Now the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossians, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude 
in your hearts. So from the very beginning of the church, the hymns we sing have been an effective means of teaching us about God, His creation, the fall, and our redemption. Our hymns also tell us about the resurrection of those who have died in Christ and the life that awaits them. For instance, I'm sure you all know the classic hymn, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. So, what does this hymn tell us about our final destination? You had so much more to say, it would be just be dull. You got to sing it. Anyway, it says that those who belong to Jesus have a home beyond the skies, somewhere beyond this world. And in the hymn, My Jesus, I love thee, love thee, it says, In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. So if these hymns are referring to the same place, the home beyond the skies in the first one is identified as heaven in the second. And then, of course, the hymn, When We All Get to Heaven, talks once again about mansions and singing and adds to these pearly gates. And the classic Christmas carol, Away in a Manger, ends with, And fit us for heaven to live with the fair, making it clear that according to this hymn, heaven is the final home of those who belong to Jesus. So going by these hymns and countless others, what do we learn about heaven? Well, heaven is a place where we sing praises to God and we live in mansions for eternity. It is somewhere beyond the skies, far removed from the trouble of this world. Now, I have a challenge for you. So kids, this is the one that you might take in some interest in this. And, you know, to make it worth your while, I will offer a reward. Hmm. Got your interest now? I have in my hands a dark chocolate Kit Kat bar. If you can find me a verse in the Bible that clearly states that heaven, not earth, is the eternal dwelling place of God's people, it's all yours. Now, just so you don't spend the duration of the sermon frantically searching your phone on BibleGateway.com, or those of you who are a little older, you know, back, going back to the concordances in your Bible, um, this reward is going to stand for as long as I am pastor of this church. And I can always get you a new chocolate bar, and in fact, I can get your choice of chocolate bars. So, I mean, if this melts, there's no need to worry. There's no rush. And I say this knowing well that this is being streamed and recorded. Now, I wish you all very well, but I think this is safe with me. You see, hymns excel at shaping our views of our faith but unfortunately, they don't always get the details of our faith right. Looking back on church history, hymns have not only been used by those holding on to the truth, but also by those promoting heresies. The Arians used to have a little ditty denying Jesus is fully God. There once was when he was not. You see, the songs that we sing hold a great deal of power. In fact, I fear that not long after I conclude this sermon, what I have said will quickly fade, but I don't doubt that these song lyrics will go on. But regardless, I have an obligation to tell you what the Bible says as clearly and as accurately as I can manage. So let's take a look at what the Bible says about a place called heaven. Now, if you're going through, if you do like a search on heaven on Bible Gateway or something like that, and you're going through how heaven is used in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll notice that it is used in different ways to talk about different but somewhat related things. The first thing that the Bible tells us about the heavens is that God made them. In the beginning, God created... There we go, the heavens and the earth. And in the book of Nehemiah... Ezra the scribe begins a prayer like this, You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all their starry host, the earth and all that is in it, and the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. 
In other words, the heavens have not always been there. Like everything else outside of God, God created them. But what is it, or what are they? This kind of gets confusing because sometimes we talk about heaven and sometimes we talk about the heavens. Well, at a simple level, the heavens are made up of whatever is above the earth. It's the place where the stars are. The prophet Isaiah writes, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And the heavens are where rain comes from. And that's important, especially out here. James tells us that when the prophet Elijah prayed, the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. And other texts use under heaven as a way of describing everything that happens here on earth. Heaven is what we would call the sky and outer space. Pretty straightforward stuff. However, the same word is also used to indicate the place where God dwells. Just as the heavens in a physical sense are made up of whatever is above us, so heaven in the sense of God's dwelling place is beyond our grasp and full comprehension. In Deuteronomy 26, 15, we read, Look down from heaven, your holy dwelling place, and bless your people Israel. And in Matthew 5, Jesus tells us not to swear by heaven, for it is God's throne. Many other passages say much the same thing. Heaven, in this sense, is the place where God resides, so to speak. So when biblical uh, writers use words like heavenly to describe something, they mean that this thing comes from God or is connected to Him in some way. So when we read about a voice coming from heaven, it is a voice that comes from God. It is His Word. And biblical authors also write about God hearing from heaven, meaning that God hears a call for help and will respond. Heaven is where God rules, where His will is done. I should, however, point out that God is not limited or restricted by heaven. While it is true that God in one sense resides in heaven, He is also present everywhere. God is spirit. And as King Solomon says when he prays to God at the dedication of the temple, the heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. So if heaven is where God resides and where his will is done, what does it mean when John the Baptist appears near the beginning of Matthew's gospel declaring, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near? The gospel or the good news breaking into the world is that God's rule, heaven, is coming to earth. Indeed, God brought heaven to earth in the incarnation, what we celebrate at Christmas time. As we saw at the beginning of our series in the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Remember, part of what makes heaven heaven is the fact that God dwells there. The Word, who was with God and who was God, in a manner of speaking, changed his place of residence from heaven to earth. And this was a clear challenge to the powers of evil and death at work here in our world. But instead of coming at the head of the armies of heaven, Jesus came as a helpless baby to start the process of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. He told us parables about the kingdom of heaven starting out as a tiny mustard seed and growing into a mighty tree. He talks about the kingdom of heaven like yeast that works its way through an entire batch of dough until everything changes. The kingdom of heaven is a field sown with good seed and bad seed that will be sorted out when the harvest comes. So the kingdom of heaven is here, but it has not yet fully arrived. That is why Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we are looking forward to. Wait a second, Pastor. Some of you might say, what about all the references to the destruction of the heavens and the earth? Well, there are certainly passages that that could be interpreted in that way. For instance, the Apostle Peter writes, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. 
Some manuscripts even say that the earth will be burned up. Does this mean that nothing done on earth is of lasting value? Should we even concern ourselves with environmentalism when we know that everything is destined for the fire? It is always important to look at the whole testimony of Scripture before reaching conclusions like that. In addition to the passage from Peter and other passages in the Old Testament that can be interpreted to mean that the heavens and the earth will one day be destroyed, we have the following passage that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. And this is from Romans 8, starting at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So does all of creation, all of the heavens and the earth, long for destruction by fire? Reflecting on this passage, one scholar notes, the idea of creation being set free strongly suggests that the ultimate destiny of creation is not annihilation, but transformation. So in light of Romans 8 and other passages referring to the ultimate destiny of God's good creation, I think it best to view passages that talk about the destruction of the world as its purification and remaking. Because in the Bible, fire can be used to utterly destroy, like the chaff burned up in the furnace in Jesus' parables, but it can also be used to purify, like gold passing through fire so that the impurities can be burned away. And it is also possible to draw a parallel between us, the children of God, because we die and then we are resurrected, and creation, which, for all we know, may go through a similar process. So if there is continuity between our lives now and our lives at the resurrection, well, perhaps it will also be that way with creation. Perhaps it will, be, it will die in the sense that we die and be remade, restored, as we will be. Uh, furthermore, to put the icing on the cake, so to speak, If we look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he says, uh, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, they get a pretty raw deal if there's nothing to inherit. So I'm supposed to be talking about heaven. So why have I spent so much time talking about earth? Well, this goes back to the hymns that I referenced at the beginning of the sermon. They would have us understand that heaven, not earth, is our final destination. But is this what the Bible really says? Still here. Let's go to the final book of the Bible. Once again, Revelation, and we will turn to chapter 21 and see what it says. I'm starting at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's move down to verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. 
Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And I'm going to add three more verses from the following chapter. Starting at verse, chapter 23, starting at verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Where is our final destination if we belong to Jesus? It certainly isn't a disembodied existence involving an eternity of strumming harps on clouds. Nor is it a distant shore somewhere far away from earth. No, it is the earth made anew. It is not a matter of us leaving embodied existence behind to be with God up there. That idea is not from Christianity, not from the teachings of Jesus, but from Greek philosophy and Platonism in particular. No. Instead, God's purposes for us and the rest of creation will be fulfilled on the new earth, an earth cleansed from sin and curse to be what it was meant to be. If we go to heaven, it will be a temporary repose until the resurrection, but our final destiny is here on earth. The wonderful thing is that instead of bringing us to heaven in the end, God once more comes down to be with us. His place of residence will no longer be above us, so to speak, but among us. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. Okay, pastor, I'll think it over. I don't like the idea of letting go of my favorite hymns. Maybe I'll concede that you have a point, but I'm not going to admit defeat until I do more research. What I want to know is, what difference does it make? So what if I thought of heaven, what if everything I thought of heaven ends up being on earth? What does that matter to me today? Well, fair enough. Let's look at three ways in thinking about anticipating heaven or heaven on earth actually makes a difference in how we live our lives now. Now, the first and most glaring implication is that thinking about what is heavenly, that is, about what concerns God, reshapes the priorities that we have today. Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And in a few verses later, he adds, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your is, will your heart be also. So if we seek possessions, and if we make glory and fame our goal in this life, we will be missing the mark. Maybe we will achieve something in the eyes of the world. Maybe not. But will it be of lasting value? What does hoarded wealth accomplish? What is the point of gaining the entire world if you lose your soul? By contrast, what God sees, He will remember. He will remember everything that we do in His service. And even if our efforts go unnoticed and unappreciated by those around us, God sees what we will do. And as our Maker, ultimately it is His verdict not the verdict of others, that truly matters. The treasures we store up in heaven are not the sort that will fade or be forgotten, but the sort that will bring a reward when God remakes the heavens and the earth. But what does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? You might think of the Great Commission of making disciples of all nations. Yes, absolutely. That should be a priority in the lives of every follower of Jesus. You might think of Jesus' command to love one another as He loved us. Yes, absolutely. We will not only build one another up in this way, but we will also draw people to Christ in this way. And you might think of the Sermon on the Mount, the 
commands that Jesus gave. Yes, absolutely. We need to be living as citizens of heaven, of the place where God reigns in the here and now, boldly living out lives that stand in contrast to the depravity of the world around us. You might think of, of study, spiritual disciplines, growing in the faith. Yes, if we love God, we will seek to know Him better. All of these things are important, good, and right. But have you ever stopped to consider why Jesus said to make disciples of all the nations? Or why the glory and honor of these nations should matter in the new Jerusalem? Or why John sees a vision of a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb? Could it be that your culture and ethnicity matter to God? Could it be that the ways we contribute to building societies and cultures have eternal significance? Does art matter to God? How about music, athletic endeavors? What about administration, the nurture and the care of others? What about growing food, constructing cities, building civilizations? Adam and Eve start out in a garden, but when we get to the new heavens and the new earth, we have a city coming down from heaven. Sometimes we only see the negatives of civilization, but it appears that God feels differently. As human beings, do we still, even in flawed and broken ways, try to continue the commission God gave us in the beginning to bring order and flourishing to His good creation? If so, the things you do now to feed others, to house them, to educate them, to create art, and all the other constructive things people do are God-honoring pursuits, provided we do them not for our own glory, but for His. To see and the diverse peoples God created, to value their cultural contributions, to value your own culture, is perhaps to share the joy God has in the abundant diversity that He brings to a unity in Jesus. Following Jesus in obedience, of course, takes priority over family and culture. But that does not mean that family and culture are without value. In light of the new earth, take joy in the good things God has given through the creatures that bear His image now, because this joy will help you anticipate what God has yet to do or will yet do. But what about the tension that we feel when we try to live out the values of the kingdom of heaven in a world that is quickly starting to abandon them? For a long time, we in the West enjoyed an unspoken consensus about moral values, about right and wrong. And for a long time, even atheists shared our values, more or less. But as Christendom has begun to fade and fall into the margins, we find that our society has veered away from things like the inherent value of creatures created in the image of Almighty God or the restrictions that God places on human sexuality so that it can flourish, or the, the grace and forgiveness that people can extend to one another on the basis of God's forgiveness. We find ourselves swimming against a very powerful current of a different set of values pushed into view through our screens, our schools, and even our workplaces. And when the dominant narrative of the world around you calls your beliefs into question, charges you with immorality according to their code, and mocks your beliefs, it is natural to have doubts and questions. Will Jesus really return? Can everything really be made anew? Can I still believe the Bible in the information age? Does the Bible contain hate speech? Regardless of the evidence, it is hard to swim against the powerful current of our society and culture. And if you ever needed a reason to meet with God's people, beyond the obvious reasons that it is hard to actively love God's people when you never meet with them, and you can meet with them on Zoom if you need to, or that it is hard to be discipled or disciple others when you rarely see them, you know, you can, or you can at least have a phone call with people. Well, in addition to those important things, here is another. You and me, we cannot stand alone. We need to take the time to hear what God is saying or the world is going to swallow us up in its narrative. You need to be reminded 
throughout your life of the values and aims, not of this world, but of the kingdom of heaven, so that you do not lose sight of the goal, so that you do not fall prey to instant gratification and in thinking in terms of your own pleasure, your own satisfaction, your own goals. Instead, you need to set your heart on things above, things that have lasting meaning and value. Because the only way you're going to find the satisfaction that you seek, the only way you will fulfill what you were created to be is by following Jesus, trusting Him that whatever sufferings you might encounter here and now, it's not going to be worth comparing to the joy we will share when the kingdom of heaven comes down to earth and we reign with Jesus forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we live uh, in a world that's becoming more and more hostile to our faith, where people talk about um, you as a, as a sky daddy, or they say denigrating things about our faith, and they say that we are detached, that, we, that our values are outdated, and that we, are, we should be abolished or, or left behind. And Lord, when we hear that day in and day out, it starts to to sink in. But Lord, help us to remember the truths that you have given us. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth has not changed, regardless of how we might feel about it, regardless of what our society might say about it. The evidences you have provided in creation, in your word, through history, through culture, through many ways, through the teaching of your people. Lord, all those things remain in place and they remain as true as they ever were. Lord, help us to encourage one another not to be caught up in the things of this world, not to, be, to buy the narrative, but to hold on to the truth that you have given us and the hope that you have given us, Lord, that you will come. And you will set everything to right, that the darkness will not win in the end, but you will triumph and we with you. Lord, thank you for your great and amazing promise and the hope that we have of being with you forever. Lord, help us to hold on to it and live our lives in light of it. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pass me not, pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, both Savior, Savior, hear my my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me by let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief kneeling there in deep contrition Help my unbelief. Oh, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Oh, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me by 
thou the spring of all my comfort more than life to me whom have I on earth beside thee whom in heaven but thee Savior Savior hear my home While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Chorus one more time. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go this week, live in light of the new heavens and the new earth, and serve the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Amen.